Hello, everyone. My name is Matt McPhail. I'm the Global Director of Systems Engineering with Scale Computing. Hope everyone's having a wonderful day. I'm here to present about future-ready infrastructure for IoT at the edge. So there's a lot in that title for us to unpack today. So let me just jump right into it. But before I do, I just want to make sure everyone is comfortable, that, that you've got everything that you need. And if you have any questions or concerns, notice that in the, the Bright Talk webinar series, you do have the ability to not only present questions to myself, uh, you also have the ability to give feedback as well. So by all means, I uh, use that. Uh, I will make time at the end to ensure that this is interactive, that questions get answered, and we, we dive in as deep or go as wide as you want with this presentation. So without further ado, I want to get into that content. So to get there, why first are we here? Well, to give a little bit of background, some housekeeping on uh, scale computing in and of itself, wanted to give you the the knowledge that here we are. We're actually a a company that's based in Indianapolis. We've got a R and D facility that's out of San Francisco, California. We are uh, a number one solution when it comes to edge distributed enterprise and a small medium IT. When we look at our customer base, we look at our customer base as customers that are needing and leading in needs relying upon and revolving around edge and IoT and infrastructure itself, specifically in the SMB infrastructure market. And our DNA is really around making sure that everything is set up to be simple it's set up so that it's highly available, so you don't have to worry about it. And the idea around making sure that you've got everything handled from a support perspective is all there as well. The, the customer base is set up regarding that, and it's actually set up such that you actually are able to go through and see that our technology partners are anywhere from edge experts such as APC, IoT experts such as Lenovo, and then other ones with Intel and Google. So with that, I just wanna make sure that you got a little bit of basis for why we're here, but regarding the content itself, when we're looking at this, we actually want to ensure that all of this is tied back to what truly the internet of things are. Now, there is an attachment in the link on IoT and the connected economy if you wanna take, take a look at that website after this presentation, but the, the perspective of internet of things we can look at from multiple different ways. If you take a step back and think about what your idea of Internet of Things is, it's probably one of a spectrum. You think of it as a smart toaster or a smart refrigerator. You think about it as a Alexa-based microwave that you can buy directly from or you think about it from the opposite side. You think about it of, from a, a smart system that uh, handles a city for making sure that uh, a city like London is prioritized as safe through the use of closed circuit TV and cameras. And really, all of those answers are correct because it's, anything from the smallest piece of physical object that is embedded to have technology that can sense or interact with it to the largest network of devices that have built-in AI and are set up to be sharing that intelligence directly with 
a centralized system so that decisions can be made about that. We'll talk more about some of those decisions as we're going through, but IT truly encompasses everything from the smallest to the largest group of those type of technologies. So it isn't just the toaster or the, the smart refrigerator. So, and thank you for the questions and the feedback, uh, making sure that we're ensuring that you're getting everything that you need from that side as well. So, moving forward, the system itself, if we're looking at it, goes into each of those different areas. You've got the consumer I.O., that I was talking about. You've got the commercial IoT, and then finally, and of course, an industrial one that's set up such that it's handling those larger loads. So again, if we're looking at each of those different areas, we see that from the perspective of the wearables or the smart home and smart office on the consumer IT, we're talking about your, your Apple Watches that are, are, are now on the path to being FDA approved to be able to track uh, heart conditions. We're talking about uh, the, the TP-Link smart plug that I have in my, my office to ensure that uh, when I don't need certain devices powered into it, that uh, they get turned off automatically. All the way to the commercial side where it handles things such as traffic control, uh, pollution, it actually uh, goes into more around consumers and what they're doing on-prem for a specific group of commercial, like casinos or retail, to even further making sure that industrial, manufacturing, distribution, everything that can handle from a management and manufacturing line to uh, specific uh, IoT for the smart cities to the uh, optimization and management of fleets. Everything is handled uh, through those small devices that talk to and handle uh, business analytics directly from there. So with regard to that, what we're looking at is the reasons why. Why do businesses care? Why do you care? Really it comes down to these four things. You're gonna to wanna to use this for boosting productivity. You want to lower a risk. If, if you've got valuable resources that are out in the field or that are outside of a specific venue or the auspices of a specific group of people, you want to ensure that those assets are maintained and valued and tracked in order to ensure that they are protected. And along those lines, those assets can then be used from an automation perspective as well. If, if you have specific lines of business that require automation, leveraging instead of just inline automation or automation that is isolated into specific silos, you can leverage and businesses are leveraging IoT to drive automation across not only an entire plant, but entire multiple plants to ensure that everything is optimized for increased productivity and through that, you also have the ability to offer new services. So, uh, one of the best that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a second is offering VIP services for specific customers that are coming in from a retail perspective or from a casino perspective. Knowing what and when and what they're doing those are new services that a customer doesn't have. Uh, the whole thought around the cashless store idea is a testament to the power of what IoT can do for providing new services for the end customer and ensuring that they're getting to be able to get the things that they need 
faster and more efficiently. So more on that, what you're looking at is it, it really demands the need for specific new type of computing because of those Y factors that are coming into the requirement around IoT. So when we're looking at that, what happens when you have a set of cameras spread across uh, central London? You get a whole bunch of data that has to be analyzed, it has to be processed, and uh, there has to be some sort of constraints around it. Like, you can't have all of the data go to one specific central server. There has to be edge deployments in order to just be able to manage and uh, re renew and release the amount of bandwidth requirements that would be there. And having stuff on the edge really is effective with that. It also helps with resiliency. <laughs> the, the, the best example that I've heard is that the use of edge computing is in no more apparent focus than in a Tesla that is using its automatic driving feature. If they were sending their sensor data up to the cloud or to even a centralized server somewhere, the latency that would be required and the resiliency that uh, would need to be done would outpace the amount of reaction time that we require for that car to react to a potential hazard. So having stuff on the edge not only improves what data needs to be retained on and acted on, but even more importantly, the latency that occurs by having that hardware locally so that it can actually outpace true physics when you're talking about going to and from the cloud. And then last but not least, probably and fortunately the most boring part of this, but it is necessary when you're talking about IoT, is that it truly helps when it comes to regulations. IoT is going to have a lot of data that's coming in and that data needs to stay locally, uh, specifically for uh, regulations around compliance, uh, regulations around geography, uh, regulations around a specific lines of encryption that need to be done in order to uh, maintain uh, a specific uh, privacy that's associated with the end user that's associated with that data. And it does require that that uh, data maintains each of those within a certain boundary and within a certain level of, of hardware. But yet that hardware still has to be usable. So specifically, when you're looking at that, you're also looking at how that solution ends up. So we, when you're looking at this slide, you're looking at IoT on the left-hand side. And all the way over to the right-hand side, what you have is what you would traditionally think of as your production environment. And you've got a lot of infrastructure between what you traditionally would have today with, with infrastructure in the core and in production, all the way back to what you would traditionally have and think about with that spectrum that I mentioned earlier in this presentation with IoT. So, You've got on your left-hand side each of your different sensors. You've got sensors in the top left that are handling uh, the optimal temperature for something or the optimal uh, cooling that needs to be done or the optimal airflow that needs to happen uh, in a, a specific uh, area or a manufacturing facility. You've got the, the, the lighting and the power that has to be there and whether or not that needs to be on or off for the use case that is being uh, that is occurring in that locale at that specific moment and within that locale obviously you're going to want to maintain a specific level of surveillance on exactly what's going on and then last but not least you've got point of sale who the lifeblood of of any major retail business and how that is actually occurring and the sensors that are tied in with all of the data that's going. And from there, it, it has to be deposited somewhere. 
and you don't want it to go again because of those reasons prior. You don't want it to go out to the core. You don't want it to go to the cloud. You want it to go to the edge. And in order for that to occur, you have specific requirements around each of the different appliances that are running virtually on those deployments or the applications that are running areas are as well, whether it's signage or the IoT platforms or point of sale, whether or not you want to put in any future AI that's associated with a, a smart site or anything that's there from an inventory tracking or customer tracking perspective. But also you have to, again, uh, from a regulations perspective, look at whether or not you're PCI compliance, uh, whether or not you're compliant with local and state law, uh, whether or not you're compliant with uh, patient law. And last but not least, you've got things such as being able to track what the customers are doing or what the loyalty is. And then and only then, once that's tracked, once it's collated, and once it's actually added in from the perspective of IoT and it's managed from the edge side, then are you able to take that data and build a structure around it in your production environment? But taking out any of these pieces presents a major issue if you're looking to future ready your infrastructure for IoT. Moving forward, it goes without saying, so I'll try not to belabor the point, but in order to do IoT and in order to do Edge, you have to have simplicity. If you're deploying a set of sensors at a remote site, whether it's a retail store, whether it's a casino, whether it's a mine in the Arctic, which we have had some of our customers do, it requires that those edge sites are likely going to have no staff to be able to handle any problems that come up. So the solution better be simple and it better be easy to use where uh, you can actually have someone that's trained on being able to simply replace hot swappable components. And that's all they need training on. Everything else can be managed separately or doesn't need to be managed at all because of the automation that's inherent to deployments around IoT and around Edge. And it's that automation truly that's going to keep systems up. If there's failure on the network, if there's failure on the hardware, if there's failure on the software, the systems are going to be allowed to be resilient enough because the automation is there to fix problems. Internally, we actually use a uh, level of automation called state machines. And state machines is an AI tool that allows for the self-healing of a specific state and condition that occurs within that state. You can think of it from the example of your O2 sensor causing your check engine light to come on in your car. Well, what happens when you truly have a edge deployment that's automated? Not only does your O2 sensor cause your check engine light to occur, but it also, that automation that's essential to edge deployments also causes your O2 sensor to be fixed and thus your check engine light to turn off because it knew what the problem was and how to resolve it. So that, again, back to the top, you don't have to have staff there to handle break fix. And with that, that self-healing can truly absorb the failures that are associated with it. And within the sites, the sites can then be quickly deployed and they can be managed with ease from anywhere in the world. So in looking at that, and I appreciate the questions, keep the questions coming and I'll, I will get to them uh, at the end. So in looking at that, we're going back to the question around production. Well, how does this tie into production? Well, the unfortunate thing is, is that it can't. The way the traditional infrastructure works today is that it is unfortunately too complex to handle the needs of IoT in a future-ready environment. Well, now, why is this? Well, that's because 
the, the way infrastructure is deployed, in, whether it's a virtual, whether it's a physical environment, whether or not you're talking about databases, whether you're, you're talking about a, 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 just a standard 3-2-1 deployment, it's the fact that there are too many parts that are doing the exact same job. You've got a the servers that have storage in them, but while well, you're not relying on that storage as much as you're relying on the SAN. Well, the SAN's got component parts to share with the servers and all of it's connected via the network. And in order for that to work, you've also got to have a management layer. And that management layer is connected uh, with in a secondary server. And that's extra hardware that you have to have also. And then in order for all this to work, really all you want is that there's an application for everything to be talking to on the core so that the edge deployment actually gets the ability to send in the data that is required. You don't need to worry about that. And in fact, when you're building for future ready, you've got to build for the least amount of complexity possible. Because again, you're worried about deploying new things out in the field that have never been done before. So your focus is on those applications and those applications in order to receive the data and then now you're building your business around the data that you're receiving from the IoT stack, from the edge stack, and from what you're running here. If you're worried about break fix at any of those levels, especially here, you won't have time to properly take the data and allow it from a business analytics perspective to improve your company. Because it's not 2010 anymore. You, you, and an organization really does not want to completely add complex piece after complex piece after complex piece to their IT infrastructure. It's, it is a zero-sum game at that point because IT is evolving way too fast, and the evolution is truly being driven by that edge computing environment where if you're getting smaller, if you're getting more efficient, if you're buying things that are more affordable, that's when you know you're doing it right, especially if you're still getting ease of use at that side as well. So when I'm looking at that, what are the areas that you really have to consider? Well, here are the areas that we focus on, but really when I'm talking about a deployment, it's gonna be a IoT deployment, that then talks to a nano data center at the edge. And these are those little point ones and I'll show you on a demo what those look like. Those nano data centers then focus their uh, replication and their features back at a micro data center. So maybe a three or a smaller cluster that is deployed of uh, data analytics to be able to handle that. And then that fog then gets sent back to the core or the cloud at the primary data center for the large business analytics to be housed on. And again, your focus always should be on the four main tenets of simplicity, availability. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that each of these areas are scalable, but of course, affordability has gotta be key, especially as you go more to the left of the environments. And how you get that affordability is that you focus on platforms that can actually do the work without having to run a lot of extra resources. For example, we've got, we know a number of other core operating systems and operating platforms that are positioning themselves in a similar space. And the problem is, is that if you look at what you truly need to be running in an edge deployment, it's probably not going to be much more than 64 gigs worth of RAM. Well, that becomes problematic when the underlying software actually takes up a third of that because of a 24 gig firmware requirement. Whereas if you can find a piece of software like ourselves that is running an operating platform of less than four gigs, now you're actually got resources to be deploying the sensor data or the signage data or the surveillance VM that is tracking all of this. And the same thing's true if you're talking about a very lightweight deployment. If you're talking about a single retail store that truly only needs 32 gigs worth of RAM in order to deploy four VMs, 
because those are the four VMs that are associated with the, your, your sensors, your point of sale, your signage, and your surveillance slash customers. If you're running 24 gigs of an operating platform and only have eight gigs worth of actual available resources, that's not going to work out at all. You're going to want to deploy something that is actually giving you resources for what you're paying for. So in looking at that, those are really key components. And when you take edge down to its completely singular cellular level, it's a one node. It's a single node that's going to provide you with exactly the amount of resources for you to be able to run those virtual deployments on it with, while still having resiliency, at least at the underlying hardware level. Now, if you want a resilient, resiliency across multiple different nodes, there's obviously the ability to, to grow that. But truly at the edge or distributed enterprise, if you know that the only point of failure is going to be the single node that can then be replaced by someone that can just plug in a, a new node that's sitting on the shelf, anyone, the cashier, the construction worker, the secretary, you know this is going to be resilient. Everything from an edge deployment is required. And also, you can turn it on its head. If you want that edge deployment to also serve as a backup repository for your needs at core or production, leverage the resources. You've got extra resources because you know the underlying operating system isn't going to take them. So if you're using 16 gigs of resources off of 28 in a 32 gig configuration, hey, use the other 12 for leveraging your business and maximizing the amount of hardware that's deployed. Ultimately, it's your money. The hardware itself is there to be deployed for what you can use for maximizing those costs more than anything. And just to give you some de deployment examples before I jump into the demo, you can see here you've got a single node edge site that's a retail store. You've got a, a three node site that can be used for a larger warehouse. Uh, and then from the edge sites, you can also deploy multiple other single nodes or three nodes for depending on the size or the needs. If you need resiliency in one of the sites, you could deploy multiple nodes. If you just simply need the ability for a low cost solution for deploying those uh, IoT sensors, you can deploy the single node. And that's exactly what the case study that we have associated with this actually did. So their problem was that they're one of the largest grocery store retailers in the world. This is a company called Ajo Del Hayes. They've got over 8,000 locations, and every store must include a local point of sale, a local customer loyalty system, an inventory tracking, a, a set of IoT sensors for their refrigeration units and for their scales, and then they have cameras as well. The problem that they are running into is that prior to our deployment, everything was its own proprietary item. The POS system was its own. The customer loyalty system was its own. The inventory was its own. Everything was. And so there had to be a level of expertise with each of these different siloed systems because they're all made by different manufacturers and they all handle different ways. The infrastructure was built differently. They're larger or smaller but there's no IT staff on site. So what are they going to do? Because they're running into problems where downtime for any one of these systems was costing hundreds of thousands of dollars per store per hour. And they came looking for a set it and forget it solution for everything. And what they got was they got a piece of software that in combination with Lenovo servers and switches with uh, load balancing delivered all of that in a stable, in a supported, and in a, most importantly, simplified version. And it truly was able to do exactly what they wanted from the previous slide. So 
we've got case studies on that if you want to drill in further. But again, just be valuable, uh, just to value your time. I wanted to take some time and show off exactly what this means for you. So yeah, I'm going to share my screen real fast and you should be able to see everything that's on it. And what you can see here is you can actually see the interface in uh, regards to a typical deployment. So up here at the very top, I've got a remote office branch office edge deployment. I've got a deployment that is associated with uh, the nano cluster. I've got a uh, deployment that is then associated with a core cluster. So within that, I'm going to jump between primarily from my edge deployment to my nano, knowing that I could also go to a core if I needed to, or I could go off to the cloud. All of these are interfaces that you can manage directly from within your web browser from anywhere in the world. I'm actually managing each of these from about 2,000 miles away, and I'm able to get everything running and up and going directly from within this environment. So if you look, you can see here that I've got a number of different VMs that are already deployed. I've got an IoT platform VM, I've got a point of sale VM, and I've got a signage VM. So I'm gonna just power those on just so you can see exactly how that works. The, the issue with deploying these really was as simple as deploying this single node at that retail site that I'm connected to. And from the retail site, it was just plugging it in and doing a two-step install and VMs can then be created directly off of this. And you can see here, I've got a lot of extra space on this particular load and that signage is taking up a little bit more than the IoT or point of sale. But everything here is managed and tracked directly from within this. And if I need to, even though I'm a couple thousand miles away, if I need to do uh, some work, on my signage platform, I can log directly into it, fix exactly what's happening from within the console of that signage VM, or I can go in and change the hardware that's associated with this. Now, the nice thing about this is all of this is done in a manner that is meant to be, again, automated and easy, easy to use. So, if I needed to deploy a new VM that's associated with this, I can just simply either create a new VM, and I'm going to call this new VM uh, just customer loyalty. And for the customer loyalty VM, I can use uh, existing tags, and this is going to be under my IoT tag. It's going to be a uh, probably a, a uh, Linux VM that I'm using just for tracking purposes. It's going to have performance associated with it. I can actually keep the memory low. I can make it a single CPU if I want to, and then I can have drives associated with that. And I'm just going to boot from a, a standard boot. I can click create, and you can see just with a couple clicks, I've got a new VM that's deployed and that's able to be installed. And that's just from scratch. If you've got a VM here, such as my Sinus VM, and you wanted to create a new VM directly off of it uh, from your production dock, it's as easy as just going in and clicking on clone. And I'm just going to create uh, a, a sensor VM because I know that the specific underlying OS that's associated with that is actually the same as what I have currently on Signage. And, but I know that I want a little bit more for the sensor VM as far as data collection. So I'm going to make it uh, another terabyte in its data path. Click on clone, and I've actually got that sensor VM deployed within a matter of seconds because any data that's currently on signage just simply gets shared with what's on sensor. And so there's nothing new that's created on that side. The ability to control the automation also is inherent to the ability to control the underlying storage and the underlying hypervisor as well. So that sensor data is now ready to go and I can click on it and I can click on customer loyalty so that I know exactly what's happening and being able to deploy exactly what's happening directly from my centralized NOC. And for example, I've got customer loyalty now, I've got my sensor data, that's handling any of my, my 
surveillance, but it's also handling anything from door locks to, if I wanted to, if this is a retail site, uh, handling my actual deployment of refrigeration. But uh, for this example, think of this as a casino. I've got an IoT platform that is uh, tracking what all the dealers are doing. I've got a point of sale tr uh, platform that's tracking tracking any of the the bank, and also technically it's tracking any of the the transactions that are happening between the pit boss and the bank and uh, the dealers. I've got signage to promote specific VMs that are associated with uh, specific games that are currently either on special or currently uh, the most money makers for the casino. I've got uh, then more importantly, and uh, probably uh, at least for me when I was uh, hearing about this uh, scenario, I've got a customer loyalty system that's tied in with my casino gaming card that gets tracked every time that customer puts in a specific game. I know the table that they're sitting at from the sensor. I know the point of sale uh, data that they are currently using for the amount of chips that they have in play. I know where they're going to because I've sent them there because of the signage aspect, and I know everything else that's tied together from the IoT platform. So now, as a VIP, that customer is now getting a specific walk-up by my general manager, giving them a handshake, offering them a sweet upgrade, and offering them some free comps because I know exactly what they're doing, where they are, and where the amount of money that they're spending is. Pretty amazing when you think about it, but also it is tracking a lot of data to be able to do that, and it's, but it's able to do it cleanly and easily so that you're taking really good care of your customers. So moving from there, from that left-hand side, from the IoT edge side, all through uh, each of the different layers. So how you do that is that this can also tie in with those other layers as well through the use of automated backups, through the use of replication, through the use of the ability to tie in within that core interface. So let's say, let's take my customer loyalty. I want to do some advanced metrics on that first. So I'm going to go back to my schedule and I'm going to set up an automated task associated within that customer loyalty system. And that automated task is going to be what my backup is going to be associated with that. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to add a schedule associated with that. That schedule on name is just going to be backup. And from within that backup, I'm going to add a recurrence of hourly, or actually every 15 minutes. So let's do that first. And from 15 minutes, I'm going to keep it for an hour. I'm going to do an hourly. And I'm going to make that set up for every hour for a day. And then I'm going to do one daily. But you can see you can create any type of specific metric associated with what the backup is, associated with what you have your business analytics set on, the amount of data and batch process that you want to have associated with that, just so that you can keep tabs on that data because that data and the business analytics side are what's truly important from the, the IoT perspective. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to go back to my customer loyalty. I'm going to select that schedule, and then I'm going to update it. Now, I've got a local backup that's being taken for all of that that can be used for uh, those business analytic process. But maybe there's not enough power here. I've only got, in this box, I've only got 128 gigs. Uh, in one of your boxes, you may only have 32. So it's enough to run enough locally. But let's send that for advanced processing at uh, the actual cloud site. So I'm going to send that to US Prod click replicate, and it immediately goes through from a replication perspective. And I could set that up with every single one of these, such that they're set up and they know exactly what's going on. So now I'm going up to US Prod. I'm getting that data directly from my IoT devices on the edge to uh, the uh, either the, the core cluster or even a nano cluster that's sitting there that's handling at least initial data maybe at the casino's main uh, server room. 
So it's not at the, the full production layer, uh, area, but it's at least at the, the casino server room to be able to handle that. So if I look there, I've got my IoT, I've got my snapshot that's going, I'm automatically replicating. Now, this becomes interesting because I can actually start deploying more stuff if I want to. I can run customer loyalty here. I can do specific snapshots. I can actually uh, build in a new VM if I want to. So let's see, I've got a, a, a future, I've got an AI app that's going to be running on all of the edge servers that is going to be doing local analytics to be able to uh, do facial, facial recognition now so that my my surveillance system is being handled better. So I'm going to put that in again, likely another Linux server. I'm going to tag this to IoT. And from within this, I've now got CPU and memory that's associated with that, add a drive. I in again, I'm going to make the CentOS and I click create and then boom, it automatically creates that. I can deploy that here, but I don't want it here. I want to deploy it at my other site. So now what I can do is once this is up and going and running, I'm going to push it backwards. Instead of going from left to right, like you have to do with the data, now you can go from right to left in order to ensure that business processes are deployed on the edge without you having to go on site. It's just by clicking on set up replication and sending it back to the edge. Now I'm replicating both ways and I'm controlling the data in the uh, applications so the business analytics can go both ways and be tied directly to what the needs are of the company. And in looking at that customer loyalty piece, now I want to run some advanced metrics on it. So I'm going to click on clone. I'm going to then, after it's cloned and I've received that data, I'm going to power it on. And from the power on, I can go in and run some interesting things. Now I am going to treat this as a high performance app. From within this high performance app, I can actually give more resources to this individual uh, to the point where I know that there's going to be analytics run on this underlying virtual machine. So let's give it a higher priority on the amount of resources that, that's there. Let's pump it all the way up to 10. Now my analytics are running on steroids because you're able to then run post-process at a faster rate and get that data even better from that perspective. And from here, now you're working at the, the core level after you've done the edge level, after you've maintained all of the data repository needs from the IoT, and every site, thousands of sites can then be managed from a multi-cluster environment so you can see what every server, whether it's Edge or Nano or Core or every retail site is doing directly from within a centralized management piece. I know what's going on at, in, on my East Coast office. I know what's going on in my Canada office. I know what's happening in Indianapolis. I know what's going on at my network uh, for my specific site or for that robo site that I was doing the Edge stuff on and see how much RAM it's using. Everything is managed from a centralized management system so that you can build a truly future-ready IoT deployment using all the pieces simply and easily. So if I'm switching back and I'm going through this, what really matters here? It really comes down to this. What you just saw with the demo, what I presented from the IoT side on the, on the slides comes down to the fact that you've got, in order to build a future ready, build in simplicity, build in a scalability from left to right, but also from right to left on the IoT edge fog and core side. It's got to be available, but in the case of Del Hayes that I showed you earlier, it has to be affordable. What we're talking about is we're improving analytics. We're improving the lives of our customers. We're improving uh, the amount that we're doing from a day-to-day -day perspective and what our employees can do. So that takes margin away from what you're selling, but it gives margin back. But in order to justify it on an operation side, it does have to be affordable as well. And that is truly what we provide. So with that, 
we've hit the 45 minute mark. So I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for any questions. And I see that I did at least get one. Uh, my apologies about the audio at the very beginning. We were working on that on the, on the back end. So hopefully it did clear it up. But the question was, how does the traffic from IoT devices reach just the edge servers when all the data traffic have to be routed through the core operations? So hopefully from within uh, my demo, I was able to show you how everything was routed. Uh, the, the goal is that uh, when you look at uh, IoT devices, you look at them from either a physical manifestation that then connects to the network that connects to a edge device that is handling at least the, the initial management or a even more importantly what we've seen at uh, our customers a virtual manifestation that allows for those edge devices to reach the edge server uh, those iot devices you need to reach that edge server so the the data traffic could be routed back to the core but in order to really make sure that your bandwidth costs are minimized and that you're able to make it a future ready, you want to ensure that it, it has a place to basically be managed first and then only the essential data that this gets sent up to the core. But thank you for that. Any other questions? All right, so everyone, I appreciate the feedback that's been given. Uh, feel free to give more feedback. Feel free to look at the attachments and links that are there. Uh, you've got a lot of good data that I couldn't cover today in this presentation. Hopefully uh, this was valuable for you. I wanted to make sure that the content was complete, but also was able to be formed within the timeframes that we had. So we, I know we went over a lot. So if you have further questions or for, need further details, feel free uh, to reach out to the links that you have uh, devoted to this uh, Bright Talk webinar series. And also feel free to reach out to any of the contacts you directly have through either uh, myself or my team or any of the people that invited you to this uh, presenter series. So again, my name is Matt McPhail. I'm the Global Director of Systems Engineering. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for spending it with me. And I want to wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you.